Hello and welcome to Doja Live. This went, no, it's Tuesday. It is Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. I hope you all got your taxes filed, right? Uh, my name is Kim Lantis and it's my pleasure to be hosting today alongside Shadar Padmatavan. Hello, Shadar. Thank you for joining me again. Hey, Kim. Thank you. It'll be good. This, this is the second time Shridhar has co-hosted with us. But of course, the guest of honor, the main person that we're interested in talking with today is Alejandro Gomez, who is the VP of Revenue at Holly Bob. Hi, Alejandro. Hi, Kim. Hi, Shridhar. Pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very it's, much for having me. The pleasure is ours. We're really excited to be learning from you about your experiences and all about experiences, what that means in travel and hospitality. Yeah, that's what we are talking about today. Why experiences, which are the best part of travel, fail to convert. We're going to be looking at customer data, how that's the crux to resolving conversion problems for travel brands. And of course, what travel brands can do about it. But before we do, we'd like to get to know you a bit more, Alejandro. What's your story, your passion? I know it's quite a varied one, your background. Definitely. And thank you for that. So I'm Alejandro Gomez, uh, born in Brazil, raised all over, kind of an army child but in the travel industry. I've uh, been in the industry for about 20 years now, so I started young. Um, and I've been working for travel tech companies for the past 15 be that OTAs, distribution companies, big data companies, um, air ancillary and, and distribution technology. And now with Hollybob, which is a travel technology company that works in the tourism and activities experience part of the industry. Uh, been alive since 2019 and we are becoming uh, what we like to call the e-commerce e engine of experiences for all travel and non-travel brands. I love it. The e-commerce experience engine. I, and I guess there's not a single part of the industry that you do not know. I, I, I uh, absolutely love it. I would say that, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and I would say that I miss car rental and, and cruise. I think that would be the only thing still in the list. Uh, I did work in car rental for a bit. Shudar, you got cruise experience? All right. Yes. Uh, we've got it all covered today. That's perfect. So let's talk a little bit more about Holly Bob. What's the problem that you are solving in the industry? And, and in some ways, trailblazing, no? Yeah. And, and thank you for the question. I think what we're trying to do is make sure that experiences, which are the best part of travel, and, and hopefully Doug and Arrival don't come on me on trademarking that, is... Um, actually get sold to the consumer, get presented to them in the right place at the right time through the right channel. And, and via converting or, or something that's highly converting to the consumer, but also generating value to the brand that's putting it in front of their consumers. I think that's a problem we're trying to do. If you look at the industry uh, in the past 20 years, even since the dawn of the OTAs, experiences have not been treated well, in my opinion. And they, they are the reason why we travel. And now we have the technology and the means to make sure that they are the driving factor of travel. It makes a lot of sense. This term that's relatively new to me, I've and it's come up quite a bit now on several Dojo Live shows, maybe not the term, but the theme, and that's the reverse planning, right? Because when you're talking yeah. about OTAs and traditionally, what I think of it is where, where do I wanna go? Okay, I'm gonna get the airline, I'm gonna get a hotel, maybe I'll rent a car, and then I'll figure out what I'm gonna do later. And the trend yeah. I think is, what do I want to do and where can I go to do it? Is Are you seeing that shift? I think, well, Brian Chesky even alluded to this a couple of years back in New York when he said that the travel funnel was being inverted, right? So I think that now experiences are being used as that reason why you travel in the first place and, and you leverage that to do the discovery part. And I think it's the only product that can be uniquely positioned to leverage discovery and inspiration but then also become the ultimate conversion tool that you have with consumers, right? Um, I mean, I come from hotels originally, and, and I come from a hotel family, and then I did flights, and they're not the reason why you travel, that it's a means to an end. They're a commoditized product at best, and, and basically it's, you're gonna get a lot of offer, and you're gonna potentially do your decision based on price sensitivity and, and your planning and the routes available, or even the type of room available, by but experiences are the real reason why you end up going to the first place, even for business, which doesn't seem so sexy or so experiential. 
then you're going there for a reason. I'm going to close this business with something uh, or with someone. And, and it's the ultimate objective. The pl you're not going to choose to play indifferently based on that outside of having a very long flight and taking a, a business class seat because you have to be in a meeting right off right off the plane. But that's just about it, right? Absolutely. Which leads me, I, I'm guessing the experiences that you're aiming at are more on the vacation side of travel and not the business side. But I'm wondering the experience, if that's something in your in your trajectory of how you can better the business experiences as well. And, and to be honest, I don't think it's about the type of experience. It's about how you generate or how do you acquire the consumer that is a business type consumer and that you're able to present relevant content to them at the right time, at the right place within their business travel. Let me just elaborate that or, or maybe even digest it a bit. So we, we have tours and activities and other experiences as part of our portfolio within Hollywood, but it's about the curation and creating that convenience to the consumer that we're going to present those uh, offerings in the first place so that they can navigate very seamlessly. It's very relevant to them so that all of that leads into high conversion. So whether it's business or not, it it's not even really the problem at the moment. It's it's the fact that these things are being presented to the consumer at the wrong time. So nobody's gonna be in the right mindset to buy this, even if for business, when they're buying a flight six months in advance. So 80% of bookings happen, four, four experiences happen within a week of consumption. And and yeah. it's it's still daunting or, or even mind-boggling mind, mind -boggling that you see the big brands still trying to put this in funnel when it's clearly not the right time to be putting it for the consumer in the first place. That absolutely makes a lot of sense because there's so many factors that can come in to change the experience that you're looking for yeah. in the day of. I mean, even. There, it doesn't there, have to be a week out. It can be, I woke up this morning and the weather's changed. Well, Actually, that's that's a very good point you raise, Kim. Like part of our offering, which we call Experiences Marketing Platform at the moment, is the ability to leverage first party and seed of party data coming from these travel brands after purchase. So, so we do a flow that's after purchase. But one of the things we leverage to give a personalized recommendation to the consumer is weather, right? Because um, I was I was hearing today from part of our team that's in Dubai, they was getting flooded. So if you're gonna put things for me, just to go out and in and Hope everyone is well over there. But that is a real live example of me getting suggestions from potentially a big OTA trying to get me to buy something when I cannot even do it. Absolutely. What's your take and what you're hearing, Shadar? Again, uh, I think I have like a hundred questions. So in some ways, Alejandro, I think what you're saying resonates because when I think of a viator, for example, right? I think a viator, all they do, you know, either a viator or a TripAdvisor or something like that, right? All they do is aggregate top 10 things to do in this location. And then if you are particular about your search in the month of April, in the month of May, but to your point, nothing more than that. Like, are you more, and it says, you know, for me, I'm not saying for adventurers, but it says for families, this, that, and the other. So you have to go and search as to what your category is and hopefully find something, right? Um, so, and you're right. I think experiences are, are sold, you know, are, you know, bought and consumed, not with a lot of lead time. So, and I could see from your website that you do have, you know, you know integrations with a lot of other, uh, you know, with providers and so on. So where do you, so what's changing for Hollywood, right? I think technique, technology wise what's changing for you guys in the sense of i mean it's very easy to throw out a question and say because of ai what's changing right but i think especially in your context does that change how you provide your service does it change how you uh offer your services to your partners uh so I mean, what what change or what are the likely short term, long term change, or at least short term changes, right? That you're trying to do because of AI in the space. Can your Viator TripAdvisor become smarter because of this? Just wanted to have, take any thoughts you might. Yeah, and, and those are very valid and good questions, Rita. I appreciate them. And also, it's uh, let me start by saying that we work with some of the names that you've mentioned, right, as partners. 
I think that what's changed for us, and I can relate to the history of all about this, that we started as being a travel technology company that was born out of the idea of two founders that found the distribution and an aggregation problem, right? So they said, I don't have access to this content and then I cannot even use it to book for my friends and generate the ski trips. And, and that's how Hollybub, the idea of Hollybub was born and then it evolved. I think that lately with all the talent that we've onboarded, the, well, we, Hollybub did an acquisition of another business that came with a lot of very high level exec talent that had passed with StubHub and Viator and TripAdvisor and other OTAs. So what we basically came to understand is that this is a consumer demand issue. It's not an aggregation, it's not even a pipeline problem because other people have solved the aggregation of experiences or things to do in terms of the content, normalizing the content, different topic for another time, but at least you, you have like the critical mass for the amount of experiences you need to do. And then you've also solved the distribution. A lot of them have single merchant APIs where you can use to consume the content and then sell it. But what I, I think they failed to understand is that this was not being put in front of the consumer where it has most impact and most uh, relevance for conversion. And that comes with a, a lot of other things. Like I think that what immediately changed for us is that we went to be to being a full travel technology company that really finds the value of leveraging data coming from brands and we enable them in a B2B, B2B for C way to generate an ancillary revenue by cross-selling and upselling to their consumers, right? It's not about us, it's about the consumer. It's actually not even totally on the partner. It's about the consumer getting the best experience that leads to conversion. I think that if you go and ask all of these companies why they didn't invest in experiences in, in the first place, they invested in hotels, they invested in flights. Right. The first thing that you will hear is we've tried and it didn't convert. And the problem is the way they tried. Okay. Not that there was lack of conversion. I think that's what changed for us. So now we are this um, AI-driven data processing and personalization engine that okay. is able to put these things in front of the consumer so that they sell. Oh, wow. Got it. I'd like to dive into the question of the data. Um, I mean, data security is a, a big thing and where it comes from, who owns it, um, what's going to happen to it when you're done. But what kind of data are you looking at in terms, we already spoke about weather, um, but you you speci specified the data leading to personalization. So what data are we are you aggregating to kind of create this, ex generate these experiences that are personalized to the consumer, the, the end user, of course? Not the it's a very good question. And in, in getting into the solutionizing part of things, right? So First of all, it's, it's very important to mention that we build this with a lot of experts in their field to make sure that this is fully compliant with um, well, current leg legislation, both in the US and in Europe and in other parts of the world, right? So initially we leverage non-PII data, so non-personal identifiable information because we wanna make it compliant. Again, we also help our, or we work with our partners to make sure that all the opt-ins and necessary means for making it compliant are built in there. And then it's about getting consent through different flows with the consumer directly. What it's very interesting is that because we leverage what you would call in travel, non-traditional channels. So forget about email, which we still do, but it's not the primary means of us delivering this, is other channels have not only more acceptance, but building opt-in through those channels is easier. And then it's because it's something that is eliminates the problem of frequency of use in travel and people use it on their day to days they're more inclined to also give you opt-in or like agree to sharing data. And it starts with non-PII and, and potentially first party data. So it's, we're processing data that we get from our partners. So it's, it's already a little bit massaged, but once the consumer gets into that flow, you see them interacting with a tool and freely giving data and knowledge directly on the flow. And that's what's beauty, beautiful about it. Because if you give them a hell of an experience, then, they will always be inclined to give you more and more data, or even you'll, you'll see their behavior interacting with the tool and you learn more, and then that feeds the recommendation engine and it makes it even better. So it's a, it's a mm -hmm. self-learning tool that will make it even better for them if they're willing to interact with the tool. It's kind and of a virtuous it, cycle. It gives you a sense of control, I think, which is nice. So yeah. asking things like, I'm curious also about ex the accessibility component. Matter of fact, America Guerrero, one of the co-hosts here on Dojo Live, made a post just a while back, very recently, about her experience of going to 
Scotland a few months back in the very first trimester of her pregnancy. And most of the experiences that were recommended to her were go visit this castle, go do this hike and cliff scene. And beautiful, of course, makes sense. It's Scotland, right? But she's like, I, I've got to take it easy. Is this acceptable for me? Can I go here under these physical conditions? And that was a gap that was missing. And that's because I think Sridhar alluded to this in, in an earlier comment, is a lot of these businesses have made their business or their commercial model about becoming the supermarket of travel where you display everything and anything, right? And the ability to do curation is kind of limited because the way you acquire consumers in the first place, you're spending a lot of your money on top of funnel to acquire consumers into that flow. And then doing the curation would eliminate all of the touch points and all of the things that I put in front of you, right? So, so they do a one fits many kind of model. Whereas we are on the other side because we already know what you purchased in the first place and we're leveraging all of that data. We are much better positioned to give you a curated thing at the at the bottom part of that funnel. And then that will lead to higher conversion because it's much more targeted, right? And then the the virtuosity of that is also that once you do one purchase, everyone is inclined to do an extra purchase and an extra purchase and an extra purchase because it's the same experience. I think I have a similar case with with uh, as with America. Like I, I I've used some of our competitors and more on the B2C seaside not our competitors but like big names in the industry and I, I traveled with my son he's seven years old and, and we were in dubai and all the things that came on top were doing bushing buggies that after spending 30 minutes researching they say they're not children friendly so i've just lost a day of my time <laughs> looking at things that i wouldn't be able to do in the first place and and that's what we were trying to solve right the ability for the consumer to find that very not even to have to see it that's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. You only see things that you're interested in or they're, that you're always going to be able to buy. Exactly. And so that helps the conversion piece, making the consumer happy. You're going to convert. Conversion obviously is in the interest of this middle B here, the business. But how does it work? Like, what does this look like in terms of integration or how is the consumer and the business interacting with Holly Bob? So basically, we leverage data coming from the partner itself. So imagine, um, let me just try and dissect the kind of flow. So you have a consumer that bought, does an original purchase, flight or hotel, or another product with this travel brand. So what we do is leverage data from that booking. They pass us the data, non-PII, and we're going to start building all these flows for different channels, including email, but predominantly WhatsApp, SMS, and other social tools. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to find, we're going to do some investigation of that audience. And based on that, what we define is when do we do the touch points with those, with those folks? Could it be a day in advance? Could it be two days in advance? Could it be just the day of the destination based on what they're buying? And then we use that, let's just call it itinerary, our first booking data to say, I know that you're going to be here in this destination on the States. We're leveraging the weather. We know it's going to rain. So you shouldn't do outdoors activities. So exclude that. We're going to do personalized shell things. If it's a hotel and it has a geo tag to it on an address, we can. We are going to leverage that to make sure that we present things that are closer to you if you have children because you don't want to walk that far, right? Versus if you're a young couple of X amount of years and you don't have children, you might be a little bit more adventurous and you want to really walk. So we're going to show you other things that are further away. And that's how the tool works. And it's all done with a partner's brand engaging with the consumer. So Hollywood is completely B2B on that flow because the consumer doesn't care. Like the consumer really wants an end-to-end -end experience that solves their problems. It's That's absolutely interesting because I think in my mind I had something about how the consumer, the end user was more directly involved. Like, hmm, I'm looking for experiences. But what you're able to do is offer the best fit at the best moment in the like, tuk, 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 hello, did you know about this? And I'm yeah. really none the wiser. That's great. Huh. Well, you're actually going to prepare for that as well, right, Kim? So the, the beauty of this is that there is also a feedback loop built into that tool where the consumer could say, well, it's great what you presented me, but I still want to learn more. And that also feeds into the recommendation engine because they're going to look for other things. They're going to look at other shelves. And that will only comes back to say, well, last time you did this, are you inclined to do the same thing this time? And you might answer no. And there's questionnaire components on that coming up as well. So 
that keeps on feeding hmm. the engine so that you get the best results every single time. And is that interaction primarily via like a chat bot or form submission? It's WhatsApp something? at the moment. It's, oh, okay. it's WhatsApp at the moment. And it, it has a recommendation engine built into it as, as, as a chat bot mechanism in terms of the messaging. Um, but the good thing about it is it only takes two or three responses back and forth to get the first, what we call dynamically generated trip page, which says, hello, Kim, welcome to Barcelona. Well, actually, if you're going to Barcelona, I will tell you, hola, Kim. Welcome to Barcelona. This is the weather. This is where you're going to be there. Be mindful of this. And, um, and sky's the limit in terms of the personalization. Uh, it's primarily done through WhatsApp because we see that it's the, the well, the kind of the fastest growing uh, channel in terms of social and, and engagement with the consumer. Even in the US, it's always been primarily SMS, but WhatsApp is growing 60% month over month. Um, and the good thing is, the adoption rates you have on those channels. So compared to email, which has seen always a click-through rate or even an open rate less than 18%. So WhatsApp at the moment has a delivery rate in our testing of 95% and a read rate of 85%. And wow. incredibly enough, yeah, better than that is that opt-out from WhatsApp is 0.2%. So people don't disadopt it because you've actually put it in a channel that solves a problem that travel has with them, which is frequency of use, right? Mm -hmm. Other brands, what is their approach? I'm gonna build my own app because I wanna keep my own consumers. I'm not gonna share the data. And now you have your phone bloated with apps that solve yep. no need or solve no pain point. Whereas yep. WhatsApp is something that you're gonna use for work, for family, exactly. for life. Like I use an airline app to check in, but I almost always, download it and delete it and download it and delete it because I need to make space on my phone. I don't fly all that often. So bye. And then, Oh, I'm going to buy a ticket or I bought a ticket. Now I need the app versus uh, WhatsApp. And I think to your point too, even an email, I don't check my personal email that regularly, maybe once a day, or if I'm waiting on something important, right. But my WhatsApp, I'm on it constant. Me. And I always will be because that's for me my main communication with my husband, family members, even work sometimes. So it's it's easier very to do, fun. right? And also, Absolutely. it's very in destination. It's very timely for the consumer. You're on the destination. You're gonna open your phone to chat, and if you get a notification on WhatsApp, then immediately you can see something that you could do in the vicinity or in that city the next day. Absolutely, or just or even just sharing photos. Hey, look where I am! Yay, mom! And then, oh, what's what experience can I do next? It absolutely mind blowing, and I'm absolutely happy to hear that WhatsApp is on the rise in the United States. I'm from the United States. I'm an expat myself. I've been living in Mexico for almost twenty years now, and it's something that was way more popular here in in Mexico than in the United States. Surprisingly, a matter of fact, the only family member in the United States I have that I communicate via WhatsApp with is my sister. But in Mexico, it's everyone. So, yay, good Same job. Thing with that. <laughs> Perfect. Great. You know, we're coming to the final few minutes of the show. Shradar, did you have anything else that you'd like to talk about in terms of experience, uh, conversion, data, what this means for travel brands? Yeah, I think. Uh... So, so Alejandro, as you look into the future and you see how different uh, geographies, right? I think in Asia, especially what you mentioned on WhatsApp or other chat tools, they're probably way forward, you know, at least Southeast Asia and things like that as compared to, I would say, at least the US, right? I don't know much about the rest of the world, but you know, a lot of the US, for example, tools like WhatsApp, right? They are kind of, some people are aware of, but a lot of people are probably not aware of it. Whereas the use of chat tools in India, you know, or use of chat tools for businesses uh, to schedule tours and various things, you know, I have myself used, you know, and I found it literally, uh, you know, and this was in Japan and I was trying to schedule something with texting back and forth in English, Japan, they don't use a lot of English. Everything was so smooth. I had some question and I said, can we talk? And that person said, why? <laughs> yeah. Right. And I was thinking such a strange response. Okay. Let me try to figure it out on text and then everything got figured out. Right. But as we look at this, either for Hollybob and your 
uh, what you bring to the table either in Asia or the US combined with these chat tools. What do you see as, you know, what do you see as emerging trends? What do you see what Holly Bob doing in these markets? So. Yeah, I mean, we, we have global coverage from start and we are exploring at the moment partnerships in India and in Japan, Southeast Asia, um, the US, Middle East. We are very big in the mi Middle East and, and Europe. Uh, I think what you see, Sridhar, um, back to your question is, there is this disappearance of third party cookies, right? So the way you're leveraging third party cookies like Chrome, in, like investing in that, Apple, will have a serious impact on how companies acquire consumers actually are able to retarget and right. market to them, right? So that is, a, that is a big problem. The other thing is Gen C, Gen Y actually favor these tools for mm. discovery, inspiration, and then booking in the first place. Like you mentioned, you mentioned China. So let me kind of try and see if I can do justice of the potential of this. So they were saying that 70% of people actually doing inspirations through social are Chinese women on app. So if you have the ability to leverage that knowledge and present personalized curated results to them that converted 3%, you're doing it seven times better than the rest of the industry, just off the bat. And interestingly, I don't know what it's like in China, but to my experience, at least in the United States and in Mexico, it's usually the woman who's doing the planning and the decision making when it comes to vacation. Yeah, and, and they're China, much more value oriented, it... right? So, yeah. so women are much more value oriented, and they they, they actually focus on um, the top four kind of drivers for booking and experience, which is why is it important and contextually relevant for me? Am I making an impact? Is it going to create an everlasting memory? It's not about the price because you're already invested at that point, right? Um, so it's it's a very interesting comment, Spe even in the U.S. as well. Interesting. You know, you do mention price, and I think this leads to maybe one of our final questions for today as we come to the end of the half hour. You're using artificial intelligence. You're using chatbot. Talking about Gen AI and how much more natural this interaction is has become and will continue to become. I'm I'm guessing you you your team at Hollywood are really excited about this um, because price for me is important. Like if I'm presented with an experience and I'm like that's nice, but if I ask the question, can you give me something cheaper or I'm only looking to spend X amount, um, are we there yet? Is that the type of interaction that we could, or I'm allergic to peanuts or I don't know, how how granular are, are we or are we going to be able to get in these types of experience bookings? I mean, the technology, it's a good question. The technology is there. Uh, there are a couple of things in, in that question that we need to separate, right? So first of all, Price sensitivity or price elasticity is not one of the top 10 drivers for booking experiences in the world, right? So people, wow. once they are booking experiences, they don't care that much about price again because they're invested because they've already decided to go. And even in destination, it's even less because you're already there, right? So why would you not do this if you're in destination? Um, the other thing in coming from, from a BI and for hotels and OTAs background is that at the moment, with the fragmentation and the uniqueness of experiences, you cannot do apples to apples comparisons most of the time. So it's it's much more difficult to do price comparison on platforms than you would do for hotels, which is basically the same room in the same hotel across right. different platforms. Right. So that, that actually, I would say helps or doesn't help, but it, it prevents from price being that big driver. I think it's, it's more about understanding your consumer. Um, and then, I think that the technology is there to do all of that personalization. Like we could actually put prompts where you say, would you rather not do, um, I would say um, a, a religious country if you want it, right? So, or something like that, or, or a place where it gets monsoons and rains and that would exclude it from the personalization engine. Like the, that is that is there. I think it's about understanding the consumer and what really matters in that flow. So my my take on that is that sometimes for the sake of Gen AI or AI and implementing AI, you, you end up building things that don't make sense to the consumer in the first place. Mm. Like, uh, Good point. I mean, we, we've seen the rise and, and kind of uh, the craziness of building itinerary buildings, builders. And in my experience in 20 years, I, I was never really confronted with someone saying, oh, we need a better itinerary building tool. That's just my experience. But then now you have a hundred companies doing the same thing with different flavors to it. Are you really solving a problem? 
And it's about solving a problem for the consumer or for part of that value chain in that uh, uh, part of the value chain, right? But it's it's not about what AI can do. Is it's about using AI to solve a real pain point that at the end of the day converts and generates revenue without additional cost or additional lift. Because the other problem mm. this industry has is that margins are not that high, right? So they're they tend to be smaller than other industries, and the cost of acquiring a consumer is going up and up and up, right? Absolutely makes a lot of sense. And it's actually really in line with the the series that we had come off of not too long ago with David Chesler and the ProVision team. And they were calling it AI washing, right? And how with their services as consultants is to help um, organizations avoid that, like just doing the AI for AI's sake and making sure that it's actually solving a problem like you laid out. So thank you for kind of laying that out even more in depth and making it make sense. Any final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us today, Alejandro, as we're at the end of your show today? First of all, I appreciate you, Sridhar, America, and the whole team for having me here today and let me rant for, for this long. Um, I think everyone found it interesting. I think the words of wisdom is, again, first of all, no AI washing. I completely agree with that statement. Even green washing, if you want to relate it to that as well. Um, I think that also it's, it's about time that travel becomes working more as an ecosystem and that we all collaboratively try to solve for the consumer. So if we keep on working in silos and we keep on having this big data processors so these big data owners, which don't work as an ecosystem and they become blockers to actually give a great experience to the consumer, then rising cost of goods sold, rising cost of inflation, rising cost of acquiring a consumer, then it will become a a business that doesn't deliver great value and only of a couple of players because a lot of people will not be able to survive amidst this kind of market conditions if you're just paying more and more and more and more. And, and I think that's very relevant when you see uh, marketing spend for the big brands still after many, many years of saying that you are going the other way around, right? So it's about time that we all add our little piece of value to make sure that there's a good um, consumer journey that at the end of the day sells and generates money across the value chain. That would be my, my wisdom. Work more as an ecosystem, more collaboratively. Thank you. I absolutely love that. And the pleasure is ours, Alejandro, to get to speak with you and learn from you today. We, of course, wish you and Holly Bob nothing but success. And as we grow the ecosystem together. Stick around for just a minute as we go off air. But before we do, I would like to let our audience know that we are going to be kicking off the second se uh, series with the ProVision team on Thursday. Thursday the 18th, we're going to be kicking off the Hospitality Advantage, Real Stories of AI in Action. Uh, that first show is going to be with David again as he'll walk through that series with us, along with Encora's um, subject matter expert on travel tech, Fabiana Mora. So join us at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific as usual. And bye for now, everyone. And yeah, thank you again, Alejandro.